Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Um, sorry for the dogs barking and howling in the background a little bit. Uh, I guess we're all gonna have to kind of put up with that and tolerate that for a little bit while we're all on uh, our own personal lockdown here. But my name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service here in Hernando County. And welcome to this morning's virtual plant clinic. I see we have a few people on here already, and I'm sure a few more are gonna be jumping on as we go along. This is meant to be just kind of a casual, um, come on, ask your questions, send your pictures. As a matter of fact, I got an email from Edwina Holloway this morning uh, with a couple of pictures she had questions about that she wanted answered on the show this morning. So we'll go ahead and uh, cover that in just a little bit here. But for starters, I just wanted to let me um, share my screen here and give a couple of updates on things that are happening probably in your garden right now. Um, so let's go ahead and start this up. So a couple of just real quick updates for this week. And that is my email address right there wlester at ufl.edu. We want to make sure everybody knows that even though our offices are closed to the public, we are all still working. So if you have any lawn and garden questions, any questions about 4-H programming, um, financial um, help and planning, or anything to do with Sea Grant or marine biology, please just go ahead and contact us. I'll route your email to the correct person. We're still here to answer emails, answer phone calls, and obviously be on Zoom also to answer your questions. So right now, we're in spring, and we want to remind everybody that the caterpillars are out. So don't think because you have a plant and you have a caterpillar eating it, it's necessarily a bad caterpillar that you need to spray and control. Because if you look on the left here, this is somebody's um, herb garden, and they have parsley still growing. And this is a very common question we get. People ask, what are these huge colorful caterpillars I have that are eating up all of my parsley? They also feed on dill or fennel if you have those in your garden also. Well, that caterpillar turns into the black swallowtail pictured on the right hand side here. So please remember that if you have a butterfly garden and you're interested in having great big pretty butterflies in your butterfly garden, they all come from caterpillars. So you need to kind of do a little research, do a little learning about what the caterpillars turn into before you make your decision to either spray and get rid of them or not. So obviously, if you're willing to donate your parsley to the caterpillars, they will happily chew it all up and they'll leave nothing but sticks, but you're gonna eventually end up with a large number of the black swallowtail butterflies you see on the right flying around your garden that are all gonna hang around your butterfly garden. Here's another example. Uh, the thing on the left here is actually a caterpillar. Its common name is a bird poop caterpillar, which is a pretty accurate description. For anybody with citrus trees or any citrus relatives, you'll find a few of these caterpillars on your trees. And you might think that you know a bird gave you a little present on the tree, but it's actually a caterpillar. So this ugly little guy right here turns into a giant swallowtail you see pictured on the right. Now, people who still have citrus and have a few of these caterpillars, yes, the caterpillars will eat the leaves on your citrus tree, but they don't eat a lot. And if you have a larger mature citrus tree and just a few of these caterpillars, they're not gonna cause a lot of damage. So I personally recommend just leaving them alone. They are a little scary if you get too close or touch them you see on the right of that picture, they have little antennae that they stick out. They can spit at you. So they try to be scary to scare you away from messing with them. But if you leave them alone, they're gonna eventually turn into the giant swallowtails you see on the right. And that's definitely a large, pretty butterfly, the kind that you will wanna see in your butterfly garden. So this is the time of year where we recommend that people go out and start scouting their gardens for problems. So start scouting, don't start spraying. You need to go out there and keep a close eye on your different plants in your garden, especially your lawn. Now's the time of year where you wanna catch any kind of problems that you might have 
as far as diseases, as far as chinch bugs, you want to catch them early. Anybody with a vegetable garden, you need to be out there checking those plants every day or every other day because you want to catch problems when they're early. You want to catch it when you only have a couple tiny caterpillars and control them before they defoliate your plants and ruin your garden for you. So it's very important you go out there and actually look very closely, turn over leaves, get yourself a hand lens or a magnifying glass so that you can see the really tiny insects and keep on top of what kind of problems you have in your garden and identify them. If you have problems with that, that's what we're here for. Tune in, I'm gonna be here again next Thursday at 10 a.m. and the Thursday after that and for the time being, every Thursday at 10 a.m. So feel free, if you have pictures that you take with your cell phone or camera, email them to me in advance, and I'll go ahead and put them on the show here to show everybody your pictures, and we can help you figure out exactly what your problem is. But you really wanna start with scouting and identify your problems before you just go to your shed and start grabbing a pesticide or run up to the store and just buy something off the shelf and start spraying because that may not be the appropriate control for what your problem is. You need to scout and figure out what your problem is first, spray second. And we want to remind everybody to go ahead and watch all of our classes that we are offering online. We do have our flyer made up for April. This has a list of all of our upcoming op online programs for this coming April. And very soon we're going to have May's calendar made up also. Now this flyer is available on our Facebook page. For any of you who get our twice a month email newsletter, this is what we're sending out to people. We have directions about how to log on to Zoom and figure out how to use it. Zoom is not very difficult, but if it's your first time on Zoom, it might be a little intimidating. So um, I can see that out of our listeners we have here today, Bernie, one of our master gardeners is on here. So obviously he got over the fear of Zoom and was able to log on. It's not difficult, just takes a little bit of practice. So we do have directions for how to log on to Zoom, how to follow us on Facebook Live. And it is very easy for us to do a program on Zoom and show it on Facebook Live at the exact same time. So we're probably gonna be doing a lot more of that. So my best advice for you is to follow our Facebook page if you don't get our twice a month newsletter and you would like to, send me an email, call our office. The phone number is 352-754-4433. And that phone number is being routed to Teresa and she will cheerfully answer the phone, answer your questions, pass your email address on to me and we'll make sure that you start getting that twice a month update so that you won't be missing any of our classes because I tell you what, I'm planning on a lot of them. Um, our Florida Friendly Landscape agent, Lily Browning, is planning on a lot of classes. And every day when somebody in our office puts an event on Facebook, I get a notification. We have our Sea Grant agent, Brittany, who's putting classes up there. She has a whole series of children's classes on different um, saltwater um, animal species, really great learning for kids. Our County Extension Director, Jim Davis, has a whole series he's doing on Friday afternoons about different animals that you might encounter out in the landscape. I know he did do invasive fire ants. I think he has snakes coming up, birds. It's even hard for me to keep on top of. So follow us on Facebook and go ahead and get our most uh, recent flyer. Hold on to those links and that way you can join in with all these different classes for free. So let me go ahead and stop sharing that. Okay, there we go with that. So I'm back on here. So we're gonna go ahead and start with some questions here, but let me start with one that I see Edwina is on here now that she sent me first thing this morning through email, which is great. So let me pull up her first picture there. And there we go. It should be on your screen. You should be able to see it. Edwina sent me two pictures. And this one picture is of a plant that she has in her yard. And she was wondering if this is shooting star plant or not. And I looked up shooting star 
The problem is shooting star is just a common name. So what I call a shooting star plant might be different than what somebody in another state calls it. Nurseries like to use and interchange different names. So shooting star isn't the necessarily the most descriptive name for this plant because it might mean different things to different people. So honestly, I'll be honest with you, I'm not positive what this plant is, but what I'm gonna do is send this picture off to a free service that the University of Florida offers called DDIS, and that stands for Distance Diagnostics and Identification Service. <clears throat> and I'll send this picture off to them and have the herbarium identify it. And next week, when we're on here all together for next week's virtual plant clinic, I'll pull up some information on DDIS, share the link with you because you know anybody who lives in Florida or even outside of Florida can sign up for it free. You can take pictures with your cell phone or your camera and you can upload them. You can answer their questions and ask them to identify it for you. And I tell you what, the herbarium does a fantastic job of identifying plants. I make use of them a lot. Usually within an hour or so, they'll have an answer back to me. If you have a mushroom in your yard and you might be worried about, is this poisonous? Do I have to worry about if my dogs or children play with it or eat it? They identify mushrooms, they identify plants, they identify insects. They can identify a whole host of different things that you might find in your yard. Totally free, very easy to sign up for, and very um, cell phone friendly. They do have a cell phone app so that you can take pictures on your cell phone and load them right up to their website, ask your question, and they will get back with an answer for you. So we'll kind of save that one for next week. Like I said, Edwina, I will send it off to get it um, properly identified. But well, let me go ahead and close out here and screen share the next picture. Edwina did ask me another question here that I am able to answer. This is a picture of one of her milkweed plants, and she has some little insects on it. And what these are is these are called milkweed bugs. And they are, um, they only, you're only going to encounter them on milkweed plants. And these insects do not disturb or mess with the uh, monarch butterfly caterpillars. They kind of peacefully coexist with the caterpillars on your plants. What these bugs do is they are seed eating bugs. So they don't really directly damage the plants, but what they do is if you're milkweed plants, you grow them all the way until they flower and you wanna let the flowers go and create seeds. You wanna harvest the seeds so that you're able to plant them and start more milkweed plants. They do and will feed on the seeds. So they poke into the seeds and suck the uh, juices and contents out of them. So as a general rule, we recommend to people who are raising milkweed for the caterpillars that you don't spray for these bugs because even though uh, you could use an insecticidal soap to kill these insects and help deter them from your plants. Insecticidal soap is not good for caterpillars. It's a very poor control for caterpillars, but it might make the caterpillars sick. It might deter the butterflies from laying more eggs on your plants. So this is one of those uh, insects that's very, very common for anybody who raises milkweed, uh, tropical milkweed in your garden to help support monarch butterfly caterpillars, you are gonna see these bugs later on in the summer. It's a little bit early for them right now, but they are out there. So if you, you can just let them go, you can ignore them. You can pick them off by hand. If uh, you're able to, you can pick them off by hand, throw them in a container of soapy water and help cut down the numbers of them that way and kind of dispatch them that way. But they're not directly damaging your plants that badly. You can just let them go. So that's our recommendation for that. Uh, let me go ahead and close out my screen sharing there. So if anybody wants to ask any questions, we have everybody's microphone and camera turned off. That's really the easiest way to run something like this. That way we're not all talking on top of each other, but we do have the chat. So if you go down to the very bottom of your screen and click on chat, you can type in your question that way. So Edwina says, thank you. My name is pronounced Edwina, Edwina. 
I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I mangle the names. Um, thought you might want to know, since I plan to attend all of your seminars, that's great. We're really happy that we're starting to gather an actual gathering here. Like I said, this is intended to be something casual. I know that in the past, people were able to come to our office and they would bring in pictures and plants and leaves and every kind of bug and toad. And we've even had people bring chickens in the office. Not for a long time, it doesn't happen very often, but they bring literally everything to our office to have it identified or ask a question about it. Unfortunately, we can't do that right now. Our office is physically closed to uh, walk-in visitors, but we really wanted to create something like this to kind of replicate that and still give people the opportunity to ask their questions, have their questions answered. So thank you very much for logging on every week. I'm the way I had this laid out is I'm going to cover about three important topics in your lawn and garden for this week. And then at the very end, give a little bit of advice about what you should go out and do this weekend since the weather is supposed to be nice this weekend. And kind of keep everybody updated that way. So Carol asked, I have paper white bulbs that I planted both in pots and outdoors. While they sent out green leaves, the tips are browning and no flowers. Both are in partial shade, any ideas? So this is the paper white Narcissus bulbs. They are not native to Florida. And even though you can buy the bulbs and most people grow them in pots. Oh, I'm trying to go from memory here. They have to be planted a certain way. A lot of people will plant them in a container in rocks. If anybody else has any, can help me out with this one, feel free to just join in on the uh, uh, chat button at the bottom there. You can grow them in containers, but if you plant them outdoors, what happens with a lot of these northern bulbs, the tulips and the daffodils and things like that, if you plant them in Florida in the winter, they'll come up, they'll grow, a lot of times they'll flower, but what happens is once we start to go into warmer weather in late spring and summer, it gets so hot outside and we get so much rain that what happens is the bulbs will rot during the summer. And then bulbs that maybe you grew up north and would be in your garden for years and years and every year, they come back in the spring and they flower, things like tulips and daffodils, that doesn't work down here because they're only, they only last for one year. They're gonna die over the summer and then they don't come back the next spring. So paper white narcissus, a lot of times people will buy them and grow them as an annual, kind of, they come up, they flower once and done, or you can hold on to the bulbs if you grow them indoors because we, we moderate the environment inside of our houses. We keep it cooler than it is outside. It doesn't rain in our house. We control the humidity. Uh, they can survive and grow longer term indoors and hopefully come back next year and flower again, but it can be a little difficult to keep them going year after year here. So I'm not sure how well that answered your question. I will put that on my list of things to look up for next week. But unfortunately for people who move here up north and they want to grow the same kind of bulbs that they did up there, a lot of them don't work very well down here. A few bulbs that do grow well here are um, Asiatic lilies. There's a lot of varieties of those that grow well in the garden and are going to last year after year. They're going to come back and flower. Day lilies grow very well in the garden here. They're going to come back year after year and flower. And a lot of times they'll flower all summer long. They'll flower repeatedly. And a lot of people will grow amaryllis which is a very popular holiday plant. People will purchase them over the holidays and it comes up in the flowers for Christmas and for New Year's. Don't throw those bulbs away. You can take them and you can plant them out in your garden. You have to plant them so that about one third to one half of the bulb is up above ground level. You don't wanna plant them deep. You need to plant them high and they will grow all summer long. You'll get more foliage. In the fall, the foliage die back, dies back and it seems like the bulb kind of disappeared or died. What happens is in the spring, they'll come back and they'll flower again. 
So a lot of people will uh, collect and hold on to amaryllis bulbs, put them in their garden, and that's one of the few bulbs that could tolerate our hot, steamy summers and the hot, steamy soil without um, going bad over the winter. So anybody else have any other questions out of our different guests here? I see that we have a total of six people on here, which is great. Um, like I said, I'm planning on being here every Thursday at 10 a.m. for the time being for anybody's questions. You can log on here. Now, let me remind you, with Zoom, Zoom does have a phone app. So you can take your cell phone, you can download the Zoom you have your phone with the app on it, you could actually walk outside with your phone and show me and all of us your question, what you're talking about. You can go outside and show us an oak tree or a magnolia tree or citrus tree that you have a question about. You could show us your lawn if you have a question about that. And then I could tell you to, to turn the leaf over and give me a better view or show me the top of the tree or the bottom of the tree. This is something that can potentially work out very, very well. And that way, even though our office is temporarily closed for walk-ins, you can still show us your questions and we can still get you an answer. And uh, as we already learned about with the Shooting Star plant here, I'll be honest with you guys, I don't know everything in the world. Even when the office was open, about half the questions that came in the front door, I didn't know the answer to right off the top of my head. But we do have a lot of resources with the University of Florida up in Gainesville, so I know if you have a plant that I don't know what it is, there are people up there who do know what it is. Same with insects, same with the question about your lawn or a tree. If we don't know what the answers are right off the top of our heads, we can investigate it a little bit and get you an answer and then get you a solution and recommendations for what to do to, to be successful out in the gardens there. So, everything here in the chat box is looking a little bit quiet. If anybody has any other questions, anybody has any other comments, let me go ahead and kind of wrap up here with one or two suggestions for things you might want to do over the weekend. We're coming up on Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. Uh, we are in spring right now. Uh, the weather is about to warm up. And the funny thing with spring here in Central Florida is it seems like some years it only lasts maybe two or three days and all of a sudden we dive right into summer and it starts to get very hot. So if for anybody who has a vegetable garden going, if you haven't planted your spring warm season crops yet, you need to go out there and get them started very soon. I am way behind on my vegetable garden. I need to go out there this weekend and if I'm gonna plant any beans, okra, things like that, I need to go ahead and try to get them in this weekend. I do fortunately have some tomato and pepper transplants and some beautiful eggplant transplants. You know, eggplant grows really well here in Central Florida. You'd be surprised at how easy it is to start from seed and get it up and going. So I do have some transplants. They're all about six to eight inches tall. I need to get those in the garden this weekend also. So before you know it, we're going to be done with spring and straight into summer. So you don't want to fall too far behind on those vegetable gardens. And I see Lily asking a question or making a comment here. I see a lot of people watering during the day and several times a week. Are watering restrictions lifted? Okay, Lily should know the answer to that. No, watering restrictions are never lifted here in Hernando County. And for anybody joining us from outside of Hernando County, your rules may be different and probably are different. But for Hernando County, everybody is under once a week watering for your lawn. So if you want to go out there with a watering can or a garden hose and water your vegetable garden or your flower bed or water your newly planted palm tree, you can do that. But for your in-ground irrigation, you're only allowed to run it once a week. You do have your day when you're allowed to run it, which is based on the last number of your address. If you have any questions about that, please contact us and we'll find out what your day is based on your address. I don't have the list right in front of me right here and now. 
but this counts for whether you're getting your water from Bernina County Utilities Department or from a well, so this applies to everybody. You can only water your lawn once a week, and you have to do it between the hours of, help me out here, Lily, 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. So you cannot water your lawn on your day at high noon. You have to do it between 6 p.m. and 8 a.m. So you want to try to set your irrigation to finish at 8 a.m. You need to figure out how long it runs for and have a start an appropriate amount of time before that. You wanna to try to run your irrigation as close to dawn as you can. That way, when the sun comes up in the morning, it's gonna dry off the leaves, dry off the grass. You're gonna have fewer problems with plant diseases. What happens is a lot of times people who run their irrigation starting right at 6 p.m. and you water from six to, let's say your system, it takes two hours to run all the way through from six to 8 p.m that's fine. You're not going to get in trouble with that. That's within the regulations. But now your lawn, your plants, your bushes are going to sit there wet all night long. And when the humidity starts to go up, you're going to start to see a lot more plant disease problems. So a recommendation we have for people that have plant disease problems is try to water as close to dawn as you can. And Lily says, but my lawn is dying. If you have Bahia grass, Bahia grass when it's very dry, is very drought tolerant, it will look like it's dead. It will turn tan and brown. But as soon as it starts to rain, you can literally look out your window when it's raining and see your grass start to turn green. So Bahia, letting it get really, really dry and watering once a week is not a huge problem for it. St. Augustine grass, if you have an otherwise healthy St. Augustine lawn, you're fertilizing correctly and you're controlling um, uh, diseases in your lawn correctly and if you're cutting your St. Augustine correctly which is three and a half to four inches high not one or two inches but three and a half to four inches high your St. Augustine lawn can be watered just once a week and still make it through dry periods just fine. Don't go into too much of a panic before you know it we're going to be through April and through May. We're going to get up to the beginning of rainy season. We'll start getting a little bit more uh, natural rain. But right now, even if you have a St. Augustine lawn, if you water it once a week on your day, you apply three quarters of an inch to one inch every time that you water it, you should be okay. But very, very important now that it's dry, you need to cut your grass as high as you possibly can. That really helps with uh, turf being able to resist dry periods of time and drought. You don't want to go out there and cut it real short because if you cut it short and it doesn't rain and things are sunny and dry, your lawn is going to really, really suffer. So hopefully that answered Lily's question about that. Um, Lily, if you can get me a graphic about uh, what day of the week people are supposed to water their lawn based on the last number of their address, I'd be more than happy to show it to everybody next week. Like I said, I just don't have that handy. So next week, we're going to cover what day you're supposed to water your lawn on. I will share with you some information on DDIS and the link to be able to get in contact with them and how you go about signing up with them. That is a fantastic, totally free service from the University of Florida for anybody with a plant that you're wondering what it is, an insect you're wondering what it is. I'm more than happy to answer it. So if anybody listening has any questions, you want to send me an email before the show next week, I'm more than happy to show it. But uh, DDIS is a great service also. And if nobody else has any other questions... We had a grand total of one, two, three, four, five, six people on here today. I think that's really great. Thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. So Carol asked one last quick final question here. She squeezed in right before the uh, uh, ending bell. So Carol's asking about aphids. I used Dawn in a spray bottle, and I killed the plant. Perhaps it was too strong. Was I supposed to rinse it? Okay, aphids are a very, very common insect pest. Different, and we have a number of different species of aphids here in Central Florida. 
So between all of them, they have a huge number of host plants. Just about any plant outdoors has the possibility of getting some kind of aphid feeding on it. Aphids is very important. I mentioned earlier about scouting your plants. You need to go out there and look carefully because aphids are very, very small. So you're gonna be looking at the growing points of your plants, the new leaves. You're gonna be turning those leaves upside down. You're gonna be using your magnifying glass or a hand lens to look at them. And you're gonna see the aphids on there and you're wondering, what should I do to get rid of the aphids or help control them? You can use Dawn dishwashing liquid. It's I think one tablespoon per gallon of water. And you could also have one tablespoon of cooking oil any kind of you know Crisco or olive oil or whatever to the mixture also mix it up really well and spray it. The problem is Dawn, it is effective in killing some of the aphids, but it does not do the best job at controlling aphids. What is a better control for them is if you go to the store, a big box store, a lawn and garden center, or even look online, um, Gosh, Amazon.com, you can find pretty much everything on there. You look for insecticidal soap. And there's a couple different brand names that you might see on the shelf at a uh, big box store. Safer soap, things like that. And what this is, it's potassium salts of fatty acids. So it's a different chemical than what is in Dawn dishwashing liquid. So Dawn dishwashing liquid obviously is very safe. You use it on washing dishes. Uh, you obviously don't want to drink it. You don't want to spray it all over yourself. But if it can be used very safely on your plants, insecticidal soap works a lot better. And insecticidal soap is a very safe and effective uh, insecticide to use. You want to read the label directions. You probably want to wear gloves. You obviously don't want to drink it or be getting it all over yourself. But if you follow the label directions, you can use it very carefully, very safely, and it's very effective on small, soft body insects, things like aphids, spider mites, white flies, mealy bugs. It works on a lot of those small insects, and it's really all that you have to use. So um, even though Dawn can be used, we recommend insecticidal soap. It's going to work a lot better. And Ashley, jumped in here. If you're growing organic fruits and vegetables, is it okay to use? Yes, insecticidal soap is labeled for use with organic crop production. Uh, a little tip to everybody who's worried about whether you can, you know, if you're at the store, you're grabbing things off the shelf, it says safe, it says natural, it says sustainable, you don't know if it's organic or if it's safe to use. If you look at the package, and you, turn, you have to turn the bottle around, probably look at the back. If it has a little label on it, and it says OMRI, O-M-R-I, approved. That's kind of like the good housekeeping label of approval for organic products. So even as far as the USDA is concerned, if a product is, has that label on there and it says it's OMRI approved, O-M-R-I, as far as the USDA is concerned, that's good for organic production and homeowners and residents should be assured that it's safe for organic production. So I know a lot of times it's a little confusing with labeling. To answer that question, you're looking at different um, bottles of pest controls, whether it be insecticides or fungicides, you're not really sure is it safe to use or not. If you ever have a question about a specific product and is it safe to use, or is it gonna be effective on what you're trying to control, whether it be aphids, whether it be a leaf spot disease or whatever, that's a perfect question to come back and ask specifically on our virtual uh, plant clinic, or call our office, 352-754-4433 and ask Teresa, or shoot me an email about that. So we're still here working, Still more than happy to answer your questions, investigate things, find an answer for you. But I think that's about all the time we have for today. So once again, thank you very much, everybody, for tuning in. We will be back here again next week with more great information. Like I said, think about those questions, take pictures, 
uh, write your questions out and be ready to go ahead and post them on here or share pictures next week. So with that, thank you very much, everybody. And we'll see you at 10 o'clock next Thursday morning. See you then. Bye.